Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how this ministry is impacting your life. So please take a moment and email us at mystory at cowboyjunctionchurch.com. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can visit our website at cowboyjunctionchurch.com and click give. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. All right, well, I am ready to speak. Are you all ready to hear? Are you ready to learn something today? It is always an honor. Honestly, I, I don't know how I can preach in 30 minutes um, because it's been almost a year since I've preached from this pulpit. I've spoken other places and create and different things like that. But to get everything that's in me out, I even told Chris, I said, God is messing with me because he doesn't even really want me to use my notes, but I'm a note follower. Like I want first service to be just like second service and second service to be just like third service. And it ain't going to happen that way today. So anyway, I'm, I'm excited. But before I start, can, can we pray? Because I want you to know, I love to talk, but if I don't have the Holy Spirit and you don't have the Holy Spirit... Ain't nothing I say going to do anything that's life-changing. You may laugh. You may think, oh, that's a good point. But as far as it changing your life to leave here differently, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, change doesn't come. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you once again for who you are. God, all I can say is I'm willing. I'm a willing vessel ready to be used by you. Holy Spirit, you've given me such good words, but I need you to deliver them. So, Father, I just pray that you bring my thoughts together, that you bring clarity, you open hearts to be ready to receive what it is that you want to speak to us today. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So how many have enjoyed the Malachi series? Anybody that's been here for all of them or at least has heard them online? Okay, a few of you. Um, You can always download our podcast online if you've missed any of them. There were some of them literally. There was one Monday night I had missed Sunday. And I sat on the front row Monday night, and I literally wanted to jump out of my seat. It was such, I think it was the second message. It was so powerful. And I just want y'all to know that you, you can always learn something. You know, somebody, I had somebody tell me one time, well, we're, we're not coming to Cowboy Junction Church anymore because the messages are too basic. I'm like, really? I have been knowing the Lord for 40 years, and I jump up and get excited because God is constantly speaking to me through the Word. I mean, you can't grow old with the Word of God. And so always come expectant and ready to hear. So in only three chapters, I'm, I'm going to tell you today that I'm closing out the Malachi series, but there's a good chance Pastor Ty will come back and preach on chapter four next week because he, he was just stirred up still with things that he had not yet said. But when he came to me and he said, Heather, would you preach on Malachi? I'm like, what am I going to preach? You, in three chapters, you have preached so much rich material. So for just a second, I want us just to go over the highlights in case you missed them. Do you know God loves you? That was huge. That is the opening statement of Malachi. God speaks through Malachi to the people and says, do you know I love you? And the people's response was, how have you loved us? Have any of us lived our life like that? Has has someone said, did you know God loves you? And you go, how's he loved me? Completely forgetting that you have breath in your lungs. Completely forgetting that you have a roof over your head. Completely forgetting the things that God does for us on a daily basis. He also talked about what does your best look like and does God get your best? And he started talking about how the priests were coming before the Lord to bring their sacrifice. And it started out as being the perfect white lamb, the best of the entire flock. And then it became, oh, that'll do. God won't care. Or, oh, that crippled, coughing, almost dying lamb, that should be good enough. God doesn't mind because I'll get more money if I keep the good lamb. God doesn't care. It's going to die anyway. But isn't that how we sometimes live our life? Does God get our best? And what does our best even look like? Do other people get our best? Does our family get our best before God gets our best? We also learned about honor. Do we honor and respect God? Do we give honor where honor is due? Do we honor the people in our life that God has placed there to be a blessing to us? He talked about building walls, how it's important for each of us to realize that God has placed something specific for us to build up to raise up. He's put a calling, a ministry in our life to build something up. And we should all build walls, but we should also have gates. 
There's certain people that don't need to be in your life, and that gate needs to be able to allow them to leave. There's also people that God wants to bring into your life, and that gate should also be for people to come into your life. But he talked about us also needing gatekeepers. Those are people that stand guard, that say, babe, I think something is better for you than what you're choosing right now. People that we allow to speak into our life. We all need people. I don't care if you're the CEO of the largest corporation in in the United States. You need people that speak into your life and that the Lord uses to be a blessing to you. He also talked about you'll never know what you want until you know what you value. How many know what you value is what you pursue? What's the am I in your life? What's the most important? You can say all day long, I want to be a family man, but you know what you value when you realize you're never at home, but you drive the fanciest, nicest car in all of town. That's what your value is. You may deep down really want to be a, a dad and a husband and care for your family, but what you value is what you will pursue. And if you're never home and you're driving the fanciest cars because work is so important, that is where your heart is headed not towards the way that you truly value and the the things that you truly love. And then this last week was one of my favorites too. He talked about the refiner's fire. We all need discipleship. Any of you that say, I have reached the pinnacle, we need to start over again because we're all growing. We're all learning. We are all day by day being perfected in, in what God has called us to do and to become. And he said this, which I love so much. He said, are you just ready or are you prepared? And there's a difference. How many of you said, I am ready for God to do something in my life, but you weren't prepared? And he talked about the ten virgins, five that had their wicks cut, they had extra oil, and they were truly ready, and they were prepared. Every one of those ten virgins said, we're ready for the Messiah to come. We're ready for the king to come. We're ready for it to happen. But when the bottom line came and the king showed up, only five were ready, and five had to go running for oil because they didn't have any. Are you ready for what God wants to do in your life? And today, what I want to talk about is in the book of Malachi, I was confused. And so I read through it, and I was like, what are these people so upset about? What are they so frustrated about in their life that they would question God and be like, how have you loved us? What have you done for us? And so I I needed to do a little research. And I don't know about you, but I love history. In fact, something you may not know about me is in August, I celebrated 20 years of being a registered nurse. So I pastor. I'm a registered nurse. I still do that today. And I just took up a new profession. I'm a homeschool mother. So if you lack things to pray for in your prayer closet, put me on your list, okay? So anyway, I love history. And if I would not have become a registered nurse, my dream was to be an archaeologist. Like you literally could just say, go out in that field and there is something old. And I would search all day for that something old. Even if I couldn't find it, I would still just that excitement to look for something old. I love history. So I began to study the book of Malachi. What's the backstory? What's, what's happened to these people? Why are they so frustrated with what's going on in their life? Why are they so angry? Why are they so disgruntled and complaining constantly? And what you need to know is I went back to Genesis. And in Genesis, God made two promises to Abraham. He said, you will be the father of many nations, and I will also give your people this land called the promised land. That is something that you will inherit. That promise was given And these people are the fulfillment of that promise. The people of Malachi are the fulfillment of the promise of God that was made long ago in Genesis. You and I are also the fulfillment of that promise. Did you grow up in Sunday school singing, Father Abraham had many sons? Let's sing it. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm. Anybody else? I've been singing that song all week long. My kids are just looking at me because I think that was my generation. I don't know if they sing that song anymore. But I grew up knowing that those promises that were made to Abraham to be children of God are my promises. These promises that are in this book, and the reason I start off here is because I want you to know that when you read this, this is not just a good book full of stories. You can't lay this next to a children's fairy tale book and say, Jonah and the well is similar to Little Red Riding Hood. They're not the same. This is a story of history. This is factual events that took place that there is documentation 
multiple, multiple, multiple sightings. Have, has anyone seen the case for Christ? If you haven't, you need to. It is phenomenal, especially if you love history. This is history. It's not just stories. And so when we read these promises that were given to Abraham, when we read these promises that were given to the children of Israel, you and I are heirs of that promise, and we can receive those things just as much as these people could back in Malachi. So I'm thinking, what is wrong with these people? Why are they so upset? Well, years ago, Abraham was given a promise. How many know, many years later, these same people spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt? These same people were delivered by a loving God through the Red Sea, but then they spent 40 years wandering around in the desert. These same people made it into the promised land, but then they were taken by captivity, into captivity by the Persians, and were in captivity for 70 years. These people, our ancestors, have been through the mill. Anybody else in this room, your life, when you look back over the last 20, 40, 60, 80 years, you've been through the mill? Are any of you still holding on to promises that have yet been fulfilled in your life? Is there things that you're still believing for? Are there things that you're still waiting for? Well, that's where the children of Israel, the people that Malachi was speaking to, that's where they were. They were ready to see the fulfillment of promises, and they were disgruntled. Do you ever read through Exodus and you go, you people are crazy. I can't believe that you're doubting God right now when you just saw the Red Sea split open. But honestly, if I were to look at your life from the outside and hear you're complaining, could I go, are you crazy? Did you see how far you've come? Do you see what God has done in your life? Do you see the miracles that he's done in your marriage and you're complaining right now, worried about your kids? If God can fix your husband, he can change your kids. We forget. And that's exactly where the people in Malachi were. Y'all have, I don't even know where I am in my notes. So I've got to figure this out. That's exactly where the people of Malachi were. The bottom line was, is that they no longer recognized the goodness of God, nor remembered the provision of God, because they were still waiting on the promises of God. They no longer recognized the goodness of God. They no longer remembered the provision of God because they were still waiting on the promise of God. What in your life, what from this book, this book tells us he has a plan for us. This book tells us he has a calling on our life. How many are you still looking for your, your calling? He says that he knows the plans he has for us. They're, they're good plans to prosper us. He says that we're the head and we're not the tail. How many feel like you're the tail here lately? How many feel like your finances are pulling you down, that things just aren't going good? God, you promised that you would provide all of my needs according to your riches and glory. This word is full of promises, yet some of us are disgruntled, some of us are overwhelmed, some of us are frustrated because the promises have not yet been fulfilled. You and I can relate exactly to the people of Malachi. So, introduction done. The title of my message is called, While You Wait. What do we do while we wait on the promises of God to be fulfilled in our life? There are three things I believe we all have to do. Some would disagree with me. I believe we, were, we all have to be born. We all have to die. Some say we all have to pay taxes, but the older I get, I realize that not everybody does that, so it's not a must. <laughs> you can choose to go to jail instead. But we all have to wait. Anybody been to McDonald's, Walmart, the bank? We all have to wait until it happens. We all have to wait on the promises of God. Right now, a wait in my life is I want a new building. And I want it even more this weekend because I have to preach four times. And it's my first time to have to do that. And I'm a little stressed or nervous about making sure that everybody gets everything that's in these notes that I've prayed about. So I would love to have a building one day that we could have one big service and all of us be together but I got to hold on to the promises of God. I got to know that God has a plan, that this isn't my church, this is his church, and he has a plan for it. And so while I wait, I have to be reminded that these promises are for me. And God's promises are yes and amen. And his timing is not my timing, and his timing is not your timing. This is our story. Are you waiting on something to come to pass in your own life? Are you waiting on that spouse to come? You look around, and everybody's got somebody next to them, and, and you're alone. 
Are you waiting on that child to be born? You're looking at your biological clock and you're like, when is this going to happen for me? Are your finances out of whack and you're waiting for something, the lottery, I don't know, something to happen to bring your finances back into order or for a loved one to come to Christ or for that son you've been praying for to become free of that addiction? Are you just simply ready for the season of life you're in to change, to be different? You know God has spoken to you in that still, small voice, but it still has not come to pass. Number one, if you're taking notes, and I highly encourage you to take notes because I truly believe I don't come up with this stuff on my own. I think God puts this in my spirit. And so when I'm speaking, I believe it's God's word to you. Don't grow weary in the wait. Don't grow weary in the wait. Galatians 6, 9 says this, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season, everybody say due season, we will reap if we do not give up. How many want to give up sometimes? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, let me tell you what I'm wanting to do right now. I want to sell everything, take my kids out of school, and get in an RV and like drive and just go because school is stinking right now. And I'm ready to graduate, and I'm only in sixth grade, okay? (laughs) I hate school. I did it already, and I don't want to be doing it again. But I don't want to want something so bad that I miss what's happening in the middle of it. I don't want my kid to graduate so bad so I can be done with school that I miss my kid, that I miss growing, him growing up and spending time with him. Abraham and Sarah were also tired of waiting. Back in Genesis, Abraham was, I believe, 75 years old when God first said, come outside. He said, look up at the stars. Do you see these stars in the sky? This will be your ancestors. You're going to be the father of many nations. There'll be more than you can even see of the stars in the sky. Do you know how old Abraham was when that was told to him? Seventy-five years old. You know what happened? Thirteen years went by, and Sarah said, I don't think this is happening. I need to make this happen. Abraham's now 86 years old, and he says, go sleep with my, she says, go sleep with my maidservant. So Abraham goes and sleeps with Hagar because God's promise is not happening fast enough for them. And guess who's born? Ishmael. Does anybody know where the religion of Islam comes from? Ishmael. The religion of Islam comes. Muhammad, who they worship, comes from the line of Ishmael. Every time we step out of the will of God, we are asking and allowing for things to come into our life that God never intended to be the best for you. It was 13 years after that, that Isaac was born. Now Abraham is 100 years old. God is faithful to provide. God is faithful for his promises to come to pass. But are we willing to wait? Or do we grow weary in the wait? We've got to understand that the wait is not a holding place, but a growing place. In the wait, faith grows. In the wait, calling and purpose are found. Don't pray to get out of the wait until you've learned what is needed for the next season. A lady spoke that to me about 20 years ago. She was speaking at a conference I went to, and she said, stop praying to get out of the wilderness because you're only going to end, back up, end, end up back there again until you learn what you're supposed to learn. What are you needing to learn right now? I'm not saying you're where you're at because it's your fault. God's preparing something, and it may just be not time yet. But what are we to learn in the season while we wait? Don't grow weary. Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days because he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. That was a growing place for for Jonah. But I have to ask myself, could it have been longer than three days if he had not have changed his prayer? Could it have been shorter than three days if he had changed his prayer more quickly? God uses our wait to change us. Don't grow weary as God's at work growing your faith. God's at work calling your purpose out of you. I love this scripture. Um, keep this in mind. Write it down. Put it in your phone. Look at it later. But Second Peter 3, nine says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, wishing that any, wish, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should find repentance. Now this scripture is speaking about the coming of the Lord. You know, people say all the time, I'm ready for the Lord to come back. He's patient in his coming because he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But he's also, we're waiting. 
he's waiting on us. Sometimes we're in the wait because God's waiting on us. And he's patient with us. And he's kind towards us. Because he wants us to get what we need to get so we're ready for the next season that he's taking us into. I tell people all the time who say, Heather, please pray for me. I'm, I'm looking for Mr. Right. I'm believing for God's best in my life. Or I'm praying for Mrs. Right. And I say, if you're praying for Mr. and Mrs. Right, are they praying for Mr. and Mrs. Right? Because sometimes we just think, why has God not brought Mr. and Mrs. Right into my life? Well, if they're perfect and they're God's best for your life, not perfect, but if they're God's best for your life, they should also be praying for Mr. and Mrs. Right and are you that person? Are you their prayer come true? What is God in the middle of the wait? In this season, as you wait on God's best, what is he trying to do inside of you to prepare you for what's to come? Point number two. Don't miss the miracle in the wait. My friend Kyla Davis, many of you know her story or know her personally, but she was just delivered her third child and she began to have complications, unable to breathe. Um, she thought it was anxiety. They thought it was postpartum depression. And come to find out she had an enlarged heart due to her pregnancy. And she was rushed off to uh, one hospital and and they don't know here, and it's not the heart here, and it is the heart, and it was just constant confusion. Well, as a church, we were praying for a complete and total healing of that heart. Today, Kyla wears a pump. It's called a, an LVAD. She wears it on the outside of her body, and it goes up into her heart, and she's alive because of this machine. It wasn't our prayer. We didn't want her to have to have the LVAD. But she will stand here and tell you, and gave me permission to tell you, that she is grateful for the Elvad. And she is grateful that God didn't necessarily do the miraculous the way we were praying because she has seen miracle after miracle after miracle in God's process. Our plan is not always God's plan, but it doesn't mean there aren't miracles along the way. If what you're praying for and what you're believing for does not happen the way you hoped for, is God still good? And Kyla can stand here and tell you today with an LVAD that can never get wet. She cannot be in water. She has to put it in a contraption to like fit into the shower because she's electrified. You know, she, she has to plug in at night to charge herself. She can go nowhere. And she will tell you that God is good. And she didn't get yet, because I'm still believing that the heart is going to shrink and it can be removed one day. But there has been miracle after miracle after miracle. Relationships that she's made with the LVAD builders, the people who have created it. She is now a spokesperson. Got back from Dallas a couple of weeks ago doing an entire spokesperson advertisement for the LVAD HeartMate 3 device that is saving people's life. And she's like, if it's me that can save someone's life, I'll walk in those shoes. What are you missing because you're not getting what you want? What miracles are you overlooking because it's not happening in the time fashion that you had hoped? There are miracles all around you. And just like the children of Israel, we can get so impatient with our miracle and our promise coming that we overlook the goodness of God right now. You've got air in your lungs. You're in an air-conditioned room that has cooled off some. You have a family that loves you. You have the ability to get up and go. You are blessed. Your miracle is on the way. The promise will be fulfilled because God is not a liar. But in the wait, recognize the miracles that are happening all around you. Number three, don't waste the wait. So many times we can just waste it. Waste it away waiting for God to do something. Wait is not necessarily a sedentary verb. When you think of wait, don't you find yourself in line somewhere at the motor vehicle department? When I think of wait, I think that I'm stuck. Like I just can't do anything. But you can be active while you wait. In fact, if you look up the word wait, it means expectant. It means to look forward expectantly, to be ready and to be available. I found this quote this last week that I really think is something that we should all pay attention to. It says, waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. When God speaks, I move. Second, it's readiness for any new command 
that may come. And third, it's the ability to do nothing until the command is given. So many of us are like Abraham and Sarah. We just got to do. He promised. How do I make it happen? How do I make the promise come to pass? God may be saying, be sedentary. Be still and know that I am God. He may also be saying, get up and do something. Be excited. Be expectant because I have great things in store for you while you're waiting on that promise. I got other promises to fulfill. This book is full of promises. It's not just one. He wants to fulfill a promise today while you're waiting on a promise for tomorrow. What is God wanting to do in your life? When he speaks, move. And if he's not speaking about anything right now, it's okay to be still. Tell your neighbor it's okay to relax. Tell them. Do any of y'all have a hard time relaxing? We're a people that want to get it done. We've got to hurry. We've got to make it happen. It's okay. It's okay to do nothing if God's not telling you to do something. That's good. It's okay to do nothing if God's not telling you to do something. You know, we live in a world that if you're not doing something, something's wrong. And I've had to learn that rest is okay. I've had to learn that a day on the couch with my pillow and Law and & Order SVU episodes is okay. <laughs> Don't judge me. It's okay. We all need refreshment in our life. And as I wait on the next thing God's going to do, I'm just listening. God, what do you want to do in my life? I'm not hearing anything today, so I'm going to stay in my pajamas. <laughs> yes, Lord, I will get up and I will go to that Bible study. Yes, Lord, I will get up and invest time in that relationship. When God speaks, that's when we move. But wait is not a confinement of your life. Wait is not wasted. Wait can be active and things can be happening, and promises can be fulfilled, and life can be good, and you can be growing, and ministry can be done when we are waiting on a certain promise to be fulfilled in our life. Jesus waited. Has anybody ever thought about him waiting 30 years before his ministry began? I mean, you're born the Son of God, yet you don't start your ministry for 30 years. I kind of think he didn't sit around and do nothing. In fact, Scripture shows us when he was 12 years old, he's lost, and he's preaching in the synagogues. I'm sure his ministry began before his ministry began. And that's me and you too. Our ministry can begin now while waiting on our next one. We've got to value God's word during the wait. Value his word during the wait. What is God speaking to you? What is he showing you? You know, you can turn on Caleb, and the Lord can speak to you. He can confirm something that someone else shared with you. God's word is living and active and it's constantly coming your direction. Don't lose focus looking at the world around you. That week, last week we sang that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. God is always speaking. If he's not using the written word, he's using somebody. If he's not using somebody, he'll use music. He used a donkey. He will use anything to let you know that he's speaking to you, he loves you, he has a plan for your life, and it's to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Psalms 135 says this, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. I hope. We find hope in the promise of God. We also need to give thanks and honor in the wait. David is one of my favorite people of the Bible. He was a man that at a young age was anointed to be something great, yet went back and watched sheep. Went back and watched sheep. And then one day someone comes to his house and says, you play an instrument, right? Can you come play for the king? He could have very easily said, I am the king. I've been anointed king. But he went and sat at the feet of Saul and played music for him and honored him while he waited for his ministry to begin. What has God got planned for you that you're unwilling to move until he gives it? But yet he's saying, honor and respect where you're at while you wait. Because when you honor and respect while you wait, honor and respect will come when the promise is fulfilled. We also have to serve while we wait. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't get bitter. Serve. David served. Waitress and waiter come from the word wait. 
It means to serve while you wait. Serve others around you. The other day, the staff was in prayer. Every Tuesday, we get together and, um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we come in here, and we pray separately, and then we jointly come together, and we pray. And I just felt the Lord kind of give me this vision, and it kind of spurred on this, this uh, talk today, this, this message today, that all of us are waiting for something. But a farmer doesn't go out in the field, correct me if I'm wrong, a farmer doesn't go out in the field and throw seed and then just sit there and just wait for something to come up. I mean, you got to water, you got to hoe, you got to, you got to, I don't know if you hoe anymore, I, some people maybe do, but you got to do something. And I saw in the spirit a farmer that just threw out a seed and just stood there. What happens when that harvest comes? That's all you've got because nothing else has been put in the ground. We're all waiting on that harvest, but are you putting something in the ground for when that harvest is gone, the next harvest is on its way? God's promises are yes and amen for your life. Keep sowing. Keep believing. Keep trusting even when you don't see a sprout coming out of the ground. Keep watering. Keep serving. Keep honoring those around you. Keep growing. And keep believing that God's promises will come to pass in your life. Can I pray for you this morning? Everybody close your eyes. Father, these people today, my heart, I just feel such love for everyone in this room I know that there are so many different needs all across this room. There's people praying for a spouse. There's people praying for a baby. There's people praying for a loved one to come to know you. God, we humbly come before you and ask, what do you want to do in us what do you want to do in me I'm willing to wait for your best I won't lose heart I won't lose hope I won't give up I won't sit down and throw my sucker in the dirt and do nothing I'm willing to listen and obey Holy Spirit just begin right now to speak to the hearts and the lives of every single person in this room and only the way you know how. Bringing comfort and bringing peace and reminding them that you have not forgotten them. You have not let go of them. Your word tells us one of the promises is never will I leave you nor forsake you. And even when we don't feel you, even when you feel distant or seem far away, we can cling on to your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So while we wait, whatever that wait may be, while we wait, we thank you, we serve you, we honor you, we keep going, we keep believing, and we keep sowing seed. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Y'all go ahead and stand to your feet this morning. One, one final thing I want to say is the process is what leads to your promise. It's the journey. And I know it's cliche. I know you've heard it time and time again. But it's the journey leading to the promise that is the joy. It's what we learn in the middle of the trial that brings the greatest faith if we went around the trial, if we went around the fire, if we never went through anything, there would really be nothing great in our life. It's through the fire, it's through the process that the miracle comes. So keep holding on. Don't give up on what God has placed in your heart. If God has spoken to your heart about something, hold on to it and don't give up on it. Keep believing for it. But don't stop growing. Don't stop sowing. Don't stop being a faithful person to walk in the presence of God and to seek his face daily because he's going to teach you something through the process. 
on the way to the promise. Amen. Guys, I love you so much. Pastor Ty will be back next week. It's going to be a great weekend for your kids next weekend. Invite somebody. Take your cards and tell somebody about Pumpkin Palooza. I love you. Ty loves you. Jesus loves you. Don't you ever forget it. Let's go love God, love people. And how many know there are no limits on what God can do in your life? Amen. Have a great week in the Lord. Be blessed.